Wednesday, August 23rd, and this is Geek Nights. Tonight we bring you the second half of our coverage of Otakon 2006. Let's do this. Well, because we couldn't fit it into one episode, as it would have been at least three hours, this is part two of our Otakon 2006 coverage. Otakon episode numero dos. Okay. D. Si. Now, one thing you might notice is that I now have my pop filter back since I made a new one. However, the first half of what you're about to hear was actually recorded contiguously with the previous episode on Otakon, when I didn't have a pop filter. After the showings, which you didn't do much to, we could talk quite a bit about the panels at Otakon, because Otakon, despite as large and awesome as it is, the panels are not any better or worse than any other anime con, and I'm really starting to get annoyed with the state of panels. Yeah, if you want to hear uh, you know, what we think about panels, go listen to our Anime Next uh, review, and that's a lot of what we got to say. Also, Or listen to the episode of Geek Speak where we were on it, because we actually chided him for his panel. Yep. And uh, also, the latest episode of Fast Karate for the Gentleman, Wah! they... T- say a lot of the things about panels that I agree with. They said a lot of things that I slightly disagree with a little bit, but w- when they started talking about professionalism and panels, I was like, yeah, you tell them, bitches. That's right. Yeah, I mean, I w- I'm not sure how it would be done, though I think if I were in a position to make Yeah, the their decisions... idea for how to fix it was way out of control. Yeah, They my... said that they should pre-screen all the panels. I'm like, there's no way anyone could do that. Well, my idea is, because I know Anime Next, well, not Animazement, I always confuse the two when I talk about them. Yep. But they really kind of vetted me out before they agreed to give me a panel. They were like, what do you do? What are your qualifications? Blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. And Otakon... I basically sent Lou my resume. I was like, Here are, here's why I am an expert, and I want to do panels on blah and blah. Here are the qualifications I have. Here are recordings of panels I have done in the past. Will you please give me a panel? Mm-hmm. And from what I can gather, most of the other panelists said, I'm going to do a panel on blah. Oh, my God. Yeah. And I, I don't think there was a lot of really vetting out or checking on exactly what these panels are going to be. See, here's the thing is, like, if you're going to – there's three days to fill with panels in, like, four and sometimes five panel rooms. Because there was one room that was alternately, like, a panel room and a video room. They were switching it off. Yep. And that's a lot of panels. And if you were to screen for quality – you could not fill those rooms with quality well, panels the well, whole time. I know for a fact that there were several panels that were turned down. That's so there, good. So there were, well, not turned down for quality, turned down for space. Ah. Uh, so there were more panels than there was panel time. Okay, that's a good thing. However, if you wanted just quality, if you set the bar at some line, I would say that 90% of the panels that, you know, even ones that didn't happen would be gone and you wouldn't be able to fill the time. Now, the thing is, other cons... At least if you set the bar where I would set the other bar. Other cons have done this pretty well. I mean, I talk about Animazement a lot because it was a really good con, but mm-hmm. they had a somewhat fewer panels, but it seems like they really, really made sure the people running the panels knew what they were doing. Mm-hmm. And in general, uh, honestly, me and Scott could do... We could fill all of the extra panel space if we wanted to. We could do 10 panels at a con and be fine. Yeah, they could just have the Rim and Scott room. Yeah. <laughs> We'd lose our voices, but we could do it. <laughs> I think we need to learn how to speak less uh, boisterously and with less effort at conventions as opposed to when we do the show normally. No, that is beyond my Well, maybe once we, get, once we get those books on miking techniques, we can try to practice. Or we could get throat mics or something. Yeah, that would be awesome. Lap yeah. of the ears. They're really expensive, though. Yeah. No, but... Um, yeah, the, the base issue here, if you haven't gathered, is that, I hate to say this, but most of the people doing panels suck. They do not know how to talk in front of people. They do not know how to put together a presentation of at least a high they don't school do level. Any, they don't do any preparation at all. They just, like, the guys, like, I'm going to do a panel on X. They just walk in and just start talking about X. Yeah, I mean, I've been doing panels for, like, five years now. And when I do a panel... Either I do a panel on something I'm an expert on, like I know my stuff, I'm qualified, and I always begin the panel by explaining my qualifications, and then I give the best advice I can. Now, contrast that to, say, the Anime Club Summit at Anime Next, where it was just some staffer from the con who didn't really know a lot at all about the topic, 
And while it's okay to not know about a topic, you can't speak authoritatively or seem to be authoritative when you're not. Because there was a point at which she gave illegal advice, and if I hadn't been there to correct her, Mm -hmm. a lot of people might have done something that could have gotten them in trouble. Yeah, and also, I mean, the problem is is that if you're sitting up at the front of a panel, there's this assumption of everyone going to the panel that you're an expert on whatever the panel is, and that you know your shit and what you're saying is true. And if that's not the case, you got to get your ass down from there. You shouldn't be allowed up there in the first place. Or at least you have to stay, stay straight up. I am not a member of whatever industry. I don't know anything about this at all. I'm just a doofus talking. Yeah, but no one seems to do that. Yeah. Now, at this point, I'd even be up for naming names as to exactly which panels really particularly were terrible. Uh, Was the old school one we went to? Yeah, the old school anime panel was probably the perfect example of everything that is wrong with panels at conventions. Science and anime, that was a pretty... We went to that. That was no good. Yeah, I didn't actually go to that one. I knew better. I walked into it. I saw it was bad. I walked out. But old school anime, I mean, they did everything wrong. It had the typical one of the panelists is someone shy who doesn't actually say anything. Mm -hmm. It had everyone, the people up on stage were in costume from other unrelated events. Mm -hmm. They didn't really speak loudly or to the crowd. They made a lot of inside jokes to each other. They just kind of talked. They didn't have any plan. They weren't authorities on anything. They just kind of rambled. They basically just, it it was like they just shouted out random anime and people went, woo. Yeah, they'd be like, so, uh, Escaflone, woo. Uh, yeah, Sailor Moon, ah. Yeah, it was just sort of random. There was no direction. You know, if you have a panel, it either has to be entertaining or informative. One of the two. So unless you're really funny and you can entertain a crowd for an hour or unless you have a lot of information and you can teach people like a a lecture at a college for an hour or however long your panel is don't do a panel just sitting up and you know talking to a room of geeks just randomly like we do on this podcast is not make for a good panel not at all hell this podcast is better than 99 percent of panels out there I mean, we're actually talking about something. We're informing, we're discussing, you know, there's something to it. Well, in the very least, people seem to like it. Yeah. I mean, we got an email recently from a listener who said that they found our intelligence disconcerting. Yeah. I find getting emails like that disconcerting. Yeah, I I, I agree. (laughs) I mean, I guess if I were in a position to have a say in what gets a panel and what doesn't, I would run the panel selection process entirely differently, and I would, one, solicit people I knew ran good panels, and two, I would ask for full-on, like, mini resumes, and at least, even if I didn't actually read them, I would demand a layout of how long the panel was going to be, what it was going to entail, the talking points, and everything. Yeah, I mean... Because people who couldn't produce that don't deserve a panel. Even if I don't read it, I wouldn't check it for content like, oh, I don't like that they talk about this anime. Yeah, I I want an outline of what your panel's going to be in a little more detail than a short paragraph. That way, maybe one panel, you know, I can tell, wow, this person really has their shit together. I'm going to give them two hours. You see some other panel, and you say, this panel sucks. It's not getting a panel. Even at the bare minimum. Most panelists wouldn't be able to put that together, meaning it'd be easy to just not give them their panel. Exactly. Exactly. But yeah. Also, what I could do is I don't, I think there's a lot of people out there who would do panels, and some of those people, a small percentage of them, can do good panels. And they simply don't know the process for getting a panel is ask. So. I, what I would do is on the con website, I would have a thing, like a panel submission form, where you would submit a thing, and then I would look through them every once in a while, and if one of them looked good, I would email them back and say, okay, send in this all this stuff, and you can have a panel, you know? Sort of like, you know, because it's like inviting people. If you want to do a panel, come and get me. You know, because if you have a, a, even though it'll create this huge quantity of panel submissions, and it'll take time to sort through them all, you're going to find all the gems in that giant sea of panels, and you'll be able to pick them out. And right now, it, it's just not easy to get, you know. The other issue, even people who know what they're talking about and can run a good panel just aren't personable or can't do public speaking. I would talk to every person who's doing a panel for at least a minute on the phone or something, like to confirm and all that, and then I'd be able to tell if they're a doofus. The other thing, if there were enough staff, and I'm considering maybe doing this for an amazement, mm-hmm. but... 
there should be, or there could be, if they could pull it off, moderators available from the con who know what they're doing, who can moderate panels that might otherwise go off track and be stupid, or panels that could be good, they just need someone to keep them in line. Yeah, well, there are some panels that, like, the OC Remix panel we went to is pretty good. Well, I think those, they're experts. They know what they're talking about. Yeah, the OC Remix people kept their shit in line, you know, because they know what they're doing. And speaking of which, we met DJ Pretzel there finally, and he was like, oh, it's great that you use my music. Awesome. And I was Yeah, like, we were worried because we'd emailed him several times asking for permission. He apparently he, has an aggressive spam filter. You know what? I'm fine with that. I very much use the broad brush spam yes, filtering. Yes. But, yeah, he was totally cool, which is great. And, uh... Other than that, you know, they ran a good panel. But some panels are a guy reading PowerPoint, which is like, oh, my God, why would you want to go to that? You know, I would basically ban Power... <laughs> I wouldn't ban the use of PowerPoint, the software, but I would ban PowerPoint panels, which is a guy sitting there reading slides. God. And... I mean, didn't these people go to public schools? You have to do presentations there. Yeah, and any panel that, you know, could benefit from some sort of moderation, like... Because, like, the Club Summit is the perfect example because it's not really, like, a directed, you know, we're going to give you a lecture on how to run a good club. It's more of a ask questions about how to run an awesome club type of thing. Uh, you know, you send a moderator to those kind of panels, you know? Now, we used to go to the raves at Oticon every year. I mean, I was a big fan of dancing at conventions. And the thing is, over the years, less and less anime or J-pop or Japanese techno has been played. And more and more generic, boring as god fucking damn it. Um, mm, 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 yeah, techno. see, I'm a fan of, you know, trance electronic music. Uh, you know, I listen to Derek the Bandit Sound Republic podcast, which is awesome. But if I go to a dance party, you know, and it's at a club somewhere in the city, I expect some trance. But I expect good trance, you know, not generic. Doom, 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 you I know? mean, Despite the fact that Oticon gets all these supposedly famous and amazing DJs, the dance has some of the most boring techno I've ever heard. Yep. Now, if I go to a dance at a anime convention, I expect anime music. In the or very s- least. video game music, something. Now, Katsukan has always done this very well. I remember one year they played mostly just like... Para Para Max stuff and remixes of anime songs into techno beats and Japanese just dance music. Yep. And a lot of DDR music and stuff like that, and it was amazing. Mm-hmm. And the worst part about the Otakon dance is that not only do they not really play the anime music at all, and not only does there seem to be extreme resistance from within the Otakon staff for changing this in any way, because the fans of Otakon seem to be about 50-50. Mm-hmm. But... The, there's always one or two DJs. It used to be DJ Maiku and it's other people who always say that they'll play anime music. And but they, they're lying. They never do. They'll play like one remix song or one like dance something. And then the rest of it is just boops, 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 Exactly. Now at least you know, Otakon... I'm not putting down any of these DJs. I'm pretty sure they're good DJs, you know, but... That's not what I want to hear. I mean, I'm sure if I went to the club, you know, out in the street where those DJs were, I might have a good time and I might think it was pretty good. But at Otakon, if I'm not hearing anime, you know, even if it was like some amazing techno, I wouldn't I wouldn't feel it the same way because it's not what I want. Well, it I mean, it doesn't have to be anime. It just has to be something that the people who go to an anime con would enjoy. I yeah. mean, PenguinCon actually did a good dance because they played mostly weird freaking music and electronica. And then they played uh, the Time Warp like four times. Yeah, but it's like if you go to the store and you're looking for X and someone at the store has a lot of really good Y, you're not going to be as impressed. But if you're looking for Y and someone gives you really good Y, then it's all good. You know? Like if Otakon played OC Remix dance music, yeah, exactly. I'd be fine with that. That'd be awesome. Or even Katsukan two years ago, what they did is on Friday, the dance was 80s music because... Many of the people who go to Katsukan are my age, like our generation of anime fans, mm-hmm. meaning, you know, children of the 80s. So they played all 80s dance music, and I got to say, that was probably the second best con dance I've ever been to. Awesome. It was, the, the dance floor is absolutely packed with people actually dancing. Yeah. One good thing, though, about the Otakon dance this year, they banned glow sticks on strings. Well, they said they banned You saw glow sticks, glow sticks on strings there? No, I didn't see, but I'll just play the following. 
All right, so I'm here with Will at the Rave at Oticon 2006 Friday night. You having a good time? That's right, 2006, baby. It's probably the best rave they've ever had. So how are you? You're missing it. I'm telling so you. How are the, so how are the DJs this year? Oh, there's a shitload of DJs. But, uh, okay, let's see here. Every, like, hour and a half or so, they switch over. Um, I believe DJ Tetsuo is here. Uh, yeah. DJ Tetsuo, uh, DJ Mechalicious, something of other. Uh, I don't know. It's really not that important. All that matters is it's amazing. So I think you've been to Otakons before? I've been to every one since they opened in, what, like 1995? Damn. You've been going around for a while. So uh, you say this is the best rave ever. Why? What's special about it? I think it's just the out outcome of all the people. Uh, really getting into it. I mean, I've never seen this place so packed in my in the entire Otakon history. And uh, this year, I mean, the music is, is especially bumping. I mean, bumping. So. All right. So I see they banned supposedly glow sticks on strings. How do you feel about that? Um, they told me that, and I went in and I did it anyway. So come on. No one stops you. No one stops me. Awesome. All right. Here's a question. What do you think about circles, where a bunch of people circle around one or two people dancing? I think it's a great idea. I think it's a way for everybody to show off their skills and just to get everything pumping. You know. All right. What kind of dancing do you do with these raves? Like pop and lock, break dancing. What do you got? Um, I've seen a lot of break dancing. Uh, me personally, I love the glow sticks on strings and twirling. I can do uh, dual t dual. Uh, glow sticks on both hands so I mean I don't have a single problem with it but uh, I can definitely get a good party going especially in the uh, if anyone's been here before you know that there's one giant room big glass windows everybody can see what's going on but they can't come in because it's only the Otakon people yeah and it, you feel special All right, here's some kind of random questions you're obviously an anime fan what was the first anime you ever saw that you knew was anime that I knew was anime okay let's think here oh man I'd have to say it would have to be my favorite and also my first, and that would be like the first episode of Evangelion. Wow, that makes me feel real old. Yeah. All right, here's another. What do you? What was the first anime ever made? Jeez. I'm seeing how many people actually know this. Well, I would think an actual anime. It has to be. It'd have to be older than Astro Boy. Oh, Astro Boy's the oldest one that I know of. It is, it is, in fact, Astro Boy, pretty much. It's really awesome, yeah. I would think it was Astro Boy. You got it. All right, here's another weird one. Can you name any directors of anime other than Miyazaki? Well, Miyazaki, um, uh, the guy who did Ghost in the Shell, um, uh, Kenjiro Yakushima. Yakushima? Yeah, I think that's it. Um, yeah, uh, Kenjiro, because I used his name on an online play video game, right? So. All right, so another one. What are you watching right now? What's good? What do you, what's, what do you, what's keeping your interest? Uh, okay, the ladies, but <laughs> let's come on. <laughs> yeah, well, the, definitely the ladies. The ladies, I, I think, they turn out and, and they, just, they just party, like everybody else, you know? They're not afraid to be partiers. And so are you single? Uh, right now, yes, I am. Are uh, you looking to hook up? I don't know how for long, because I just got a girl to sign the back of my badge with her uh, phone number. Oh, that is beautiful. <laughs> uh, uh, can you think of anything better? Come on, seriously. That's what cons are all about. Cons are all about, and it's about meeting people you like and feeling at home with the people you know, even though you don't know their name. <laughs> so are you going to any other cons other than Otakon? Um, I'll definitely be going to, to Koshikon in Pittsburgh. That's where I live. Um, that's a great... It's it's. They say in, like five years or so it's going to be as big as uh, Otakon so Damn. wait I mean it's every year it grows and grows and grows last year it was at the Monroe Monroeville Center and then the year before that it was at a hotel and just like a small lobby and it just blew up like I mean there was like I think 6,000 people there and it blew up it was awesome damn all right thank you very much thank you brother now see this kid I'm glad he was having a great time but he illustrates the main gripes I have with the Otakon dances. That, one, I mean, aside from the music, which, in my opinion, has just gotten worse and worse over the years, but the glow sticks alone are fine. But the fact that people will take glow sticks, put them on strings, swing them around, being a danger to themselves and everyone. Yeah, I mean, it's, I'm all good with the raver, you know, glow sticks on string thing, but in a crowded-ass dance floor, that is not the time or the place. Two... 
he spoke about circles as though it was a good thing. Now, circling is basically a thing that happens in a shitty dance. Whenever the dance music is so bad that no one can really dance to it, or the crowd is just so non-pumped up, what happens is a lot of people will form a big circle where they kind of stand there, kind of shuffling to the beat. And there's a big empty space in the middle of them in the shape of a circle. And then, like, the three people who at least think they know how to dance will be in the middle of this, in and out, dancing, while the crowd kind of... Yeah, like, like some guy who's a mediocre break dancer will go into the middle of this circle and start break dancing while everyone else is sort of like this spectator in a crowd now, staring at if you ever them. go to a real dance club where good music is playing and everyone's dancing... That doesn't happen. No, and it doesn't. And in fact, we have DJ friends, and, and Tex was the one who was always so mad about this because he does lights and stuff for dance parties and clubs and everything. Mm-hmm. And circles are the first sign that the DJ is sucking. Yep. The moment circles form, you've got a problem. That means that your dance is not going well. And I got to say, the, the dance at Oticon, I wandered around it while I was after I interviewed this kid. Maybe 15% of the people there were dancing. Most of them were either making out in the corner... Or just standing If you're there. making out, you have a hotel room. Hello. No, but they were just standing there. And I don't know if it's the music or the fact that anime fans are shy or what, but it was really kind of mediocre, and I really was not at all impressed. Though at least the smell was not there this year. Yeah. You know what I actually think they need at the Otakon rave and dance, besides more anime-style music? If you've ever been to a, a wedding or bar mitzvah, right, and you order a DJ for a wedding or a bar mitzvah, you don't just get a DJ with a bunch of music. They give you dancers and an MC. You don't necessarily need the dancers. Not many places get the dancers. Yeah, you, you don't really need the dancers at the anime convention because all they do is they do a dance and then everyone copies what they do. And then occasionally they do cool dances because they are professional dancers and everyone goes ooh and ah. You don't really need them. You need to hire the MC, the guy who, you know, because the DJ just sits there with headphones mixing the music. The MC is like, all right, everybody, let's get it up here. Woo! See, I disagree because generally I find MCs to be just kind of forced and annoying. Some of them are forced and annoying. However, there are good MCs, professional ones, who can really, you know, they can get people excited. They, it's sort of like you're, they corral all those, you know, people just standing there and the people making out and, you know, the circles, you know, and they corral the people and they kind of manage the crowd, you know, by talking and telling them what to do and, well, you know, I guess massaging them. many of the people who go to an anime con dance would probably resent that because ravers in general seem to really dislike the idea of an MC. Uh, that is true. However, if it was, you know, like a cool anime guy MC with the cool anime music, you know, He'd be like, let's say you started playing, like, I don't know, some theme from, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, World Good of Warcraft job. or something. And then he started getting people with the Leroy Jenkinses, you know? It's like, it's got to be a nerdy, cool guy. Well, in the end, I guess what I would like to see happen is that Otakon always seems to say that the rave is what people want, so this is what we give them. But many of the people I talk to want exactly what I want. And a lot of them really wonder why that is not represented at all at I think the what it biggest is, anime con in the East. I think what it is, they ask the people at the rave what they want, and that's what they want. I think if they switch to what we want, you would see just as many people at the rave, but you would see just a completely different set of people. Well, what I'd like to see, because this would end the debate for once and once and for all, is if Otakon would allow two or three DJs who play nothing but, like, OC remixes and remix anime music and Para Para Max stuff and DDR music and advertise them as much as they advertise the rest of the DJs and see what happens on the dance floor. Yeah. Because I got to say, the despite the fact that, I mean, RIT Anime Club is nowhere near the size of Otakon. In fact, RIT, was when we went there, was a, a little more than half the size of Otakon, mm-hmm. and it was a whole college. But the anime dance parties we ran were early on very successful playing anime music because that's what people wanted to dance to, especially shy anime fans. Yeah, I mean a lot of anime fans were going to be fans, intimidated by the rave stuff. You know. Yeah, there's a lot of somewhat nerdy, geeky anime fans who really just 
if they're like MC Chris was up there, or if there's some nerdy music, they'll get out there and flail yeah, around see, like a nerd. If you had MC Chris as the MC and not doing a concert, he could totally get the people into it, no matter what the hell music it was. You he know? could just do a concert. MC Chris got the Katsukan crowd riled. Yeah, up. you see, that's the that's the kind of MC and I'm talking about. Well, he know? didn't really MC. He just did a concert and then but yelled see, a bunch. Yeah, I mean, but that's what an MC is. No, no, no I mean, he, not... he did a concert, he yelled a bunch, and then he walked away. Yeah. He didn't keep talking. No, there was no MC during it's anything. It's the reason else. he's called MC Chris though. That concert was MCing in a way, you yeah, kind of. That's, you know, it's that's what it's about. You know, this MC just means you're a guy with a microphone. Well, it, it means master you, of ceremonies. Yes, and you you there's a ceremony and you master it and you get people excited in whatever way you can. It doesn't necessarily well, mean you know, the typical what the guy does at a bar mitzvah. Yeah, but know? generally the MC is there throughout the entire event. MC Chris got off the stage and never came back. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, yeah. I think what Otakon should actually do is on Friday, full-on crazy rave. Or no, or Friday, have all the anime OC Remix cool people. And on Saturday, keep the crazy rave. I say for now, just have one DJ who will do that and see if he's popular. Yeah, that too. But yeah, generally, I think the, in the long run, to appease both I mean, groups, the thing is, if you have two dances, you do one one way and one the other way. Otakon always, I mean, the staffers always say, and all the feedback I listen to, they always say that it's 50-50. Yet, if it's 50-50, how come the dance always waits that's, 100% toward the ravers? That's what I'm saying. If it's 50-50, then there's two dance rooms at Otakon. Maybe you should make one yeah, room. Yeah, currently, the way it works is one room is going boom, boom. Boom, and boom. the other room is going doom, 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 yeah, The other room is like slightly doom, 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 doom. faster, but it's really not any better. And you usually can't even get in there. Yeah. They, they want, if it's 50-50, one room should be the music we want, and one room should be the ravers. Or one night should be the music we want, and one night should be the ravers. You have so much dance time, you know, you can do that. Why not? You know, why if it's a 50-50, why is 100% going to the ravers? It's not right. Now, because the concert was overlapping on Saturday with the club summit that we had to attend, since I was a panelist and we always make trouble there, we had to go to the concert on Friday evening instead. I kind of like that, though, because it used to be where the concert would just be at one set time, and, you know, if you had something else to do at that time, oh, sorry, no concert. Yep. Having the same concert twice, once at night and one in the afternoon, meant... You know, some people could go at night, some people go in the afternoon, especially since the venue was smaller, you know, be so where before the concert was in a crazy huge place, everyone could fit in at once, you know, if everyone couldn't fit in at once at that place. So having it twice let more people go, which was cool. Well, I thought it was great, except I saw in the forums and around the internet a lot of complaints about the fact that there were two concerts, mostly from people who really don't seem to understand what was going on. It was the same concert twice. Yeah, and most of the people who were complaining said something to the effect of, I didn't, I wasn't able to go to both of them, or I don't have time to go to two, or it'll take up my whole con if I go to both concerts. Yeah, I, I do think that it, you know, it was pretty obvious to me that it was the same concert It was twice. obvious to anyone with a brain that yeah. it was the same concert. The thing is, is a lot of people didn't have brains, and it didn't actually say anywhere, they, both concerts are the same. And also, I, don't, I wasn't qu quite sure if there were any measures in place to make sure people didn't go to both. No, there really weren't yeah. at all. I, I think it would have been a little bit more fair if they made sure that, you know, you See, can't go to both. I don't think many people actually tried to go to both because the people who would want to go to the Saturday day one who were in the cosplay or the masquerade would have some trouble anyway. Yeah, that's true. Now, the nice thing is that the concert this year, a new thing for Otakon, was in the power plant a few blocks away. Uh, I don't think it was in the power plant. I think it was well, in it the was Ram's ne head was, next to the power. It was in the power plant area next yeah. in the Ram's head. Like, the power plant, there's this whole area with all these restaurants and bars, and there's this uh, venue right there called the Ram's Head. Mm -hmm. And I got to say, it, at least it's my opinion, that that was a fantastic idea on Otakon's part. Yeah, I would never would have thought of that, but as soon as you told me, you know, hey, let's have the concert in... A concert place. And I'm like, oh my god, Captain Obvious to the rescue. Now again, I saw a number of complaints about this decision, but every single one of them was from a cosplayer who didn't want to walk there in their costume and didn't want to bother changing out of their costume for the concert. All right, uh, tough. Well, I gotta say, even if it were connected to Otakon, you really can't go to a concert like that in a costume and expect the costume to survive. 
Yeah, well, I think the thing is, is that, you know, in years past, the concerts at Oticon have been seated, you know? So if you were on a cosplay, you would just go somewhere, sit down. Well, in fact, remember when we went to the TMR concert and some whiny fangirls behind us got mad because we stood up and danced during the concert. Yep, exactly. And they couldn't see because they wanted to just sit there and be quiet and not move. Yep, and then at the con feedback session, I said, you know, how come the con, how come there were seats? How come it wasn't general admission? You know, how can there wasn't at least standing up front? And the guy was basically like, yeah, we couldn't do it for this reason and this reason. He had good reasons. And, you know, there was like, they're not allowed to do that in the BCC and all sorts of stuff. And having it at this venue completely got rid of that. Now it was like a normal concert. It was like any concert I go see in Manhattan. Yep. I think the thing is, is that really pushes out the, uh, you know, the nerdy types who... uh, Yeah, I noticed it seemed, because I talked to a lot of people at the con who didn't go to the concert. And I found that one, it seems that most of the people who had complaints about the concert at all were the people who chose not to go. Mm-hmm. And two, the people who chose not to go, most of the reasons they gave were, I don't want to sound harsh, but I mean, a lot of people had good reason, you know, they were doing other things or whatever, but a lot of people, it just seemed like they were uncomfortable going to a real venue or venturing away from the convention center or anything like that. Yeah, I'd really like to do a poll of like people who didn't go to the concert and what their reasons were. I imagine a lot of people just didn't have interest in the musical groups. Yeah, which is perfectly understandable. I mean, honestly, we'll talk about this in a bit. I was very pleasantly surprised with what kind of band Muck was because I had no idea. Yeah, well, I'm also, we'll talk about it in a minute, but yeah, and I'm sure, you know, the other large group of people who didn't go to the concert were people who were intimidated by real concerts. Yeah, I mean, I did see there were a lot of people who went to the concert and they lined up like an hour before, even though everyone knew it was GA. There's really no reason to line up. You can pretty much stand wherever you want to stand. Yeah, and it's like as soon as you had the sticker or the ticket, you know, you were guaranteed to get in no matter what. So we just kind of were eating dinner. People were going through the line. We saw this huge line for the concert form while we were no, eating dinner. No, it wasn't dinner. that huge. It was, pre- it was huge compared to what it should have been. It should have been non-existent. Is, it should have been non-existent. And the best part was all the, all the somewhat nerdy people who decided to go, which one more power to them, I note that they could have just pushed their way up to the front like people in concerts do, but they all kind of stood in the back where they couldn't see. Or they stood upstairs. Yeah, a lot of people went upstairs where you really couldn't see anything. Well, you can see upstairs just now, fine. Now, from what people said, you couldn't see anything upstairs because all the rails were already filled with people standing right oh, up Oh, yeah, if you're them. standing on the rail, then you're good. If you're standing behind someone who's... Uh, Scott, there weren't, wasn't so much space by the rails, and those filled up pretty much immediately from all those people who lined up. Yep. Uh, hey. You know, if it, basically upstairs is really supposed to be sort of a less densely populated area, you know, for people who need to take a break or that sort of thing. But the funny part was getting in, they split us off. Well, basically, there's a bar in there and they ask anyone who wants to drink, get in this line. Mm-hmm. And we were like, whatever. I don't feel like drinking. I've already been drinking for the past two days. I'm not going to buy an expensive drink at a club. Yep. Then we noticed that there was pretty much no line there because not many of the people were over 21. So we all walk over there. We, they check our IDs, we skip the entire line, and we're dumped out right in the concert instead of all the way around in the back. Yep, another good thing about that line was they gave you a wristband instead of drawing marker on your hand. Yes. Which, which I approved of because, hey, now I don't have to wash my hands to get this black mark off. I can just rip this thing off my arm after the show. Yep, so we got right in right before the concert started, and we also had a good dinner, and we didn't have to stand in any lines. Awesome. Now, the concert itself consisted of two parts. The first half was uh, Nana Kitare, mm-hmm. who is a, you know, like, gothic Lolita idol singer, yeah. I guess would be the way I would describe her. And I think that's the way she was described on the website. Well, she did what? The first closer to uh, FMA. Yep, that's what she did. And, and she, she did that song first. And she did the opener to the new Powerpuff Girls Z show. God. All right. The song is all right. Typical cutesy, you know, la la la, I'm a say you singing about cute things, but good God, is that show moe and scary. Yeah, it is. <laughs> but that's I think I think Nanakatade in general is moe and kind of scary. Ah, she seemed kind of cool. Yeah. She little... was also, I'll admit, she was really cute. Eh, not so much. What? What are you talking about? Eh. Eh? Not my style. I don't think your style is women. I think it is. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how you can deny that Nanakitade is cute. She wasn't bad. She wasn't, like, ugly or nasty. But she wasn't like, oh, wow. Woo. I can't imagine what kind of woman you would consider attractive. One that's not crazy. I don't think she's crazy at all. I don't know where you get that. Yeah, I think she was a little crazy. <laughs> you realize that most of the say you type stuff is just an act because she's a musician and a professional. Yeah. Yeah. 
And I'm not a fan of that. Okay. Anyway, her concert was really good. I mean, obviously, she didn't bring a band or anything, so she just sang over effectively the karaoke versions of her songs and mine playing a guitar. Yep. Which her hair then got tangled in. Yeah. Yeah. Which, at first, I thought, I wonder if that's staged, because I've seen a lot of Seiyu stage stuff like that, but I never got around to asking anyone in the second concert if the same thing happened. Yeah, I was trying to tell if, like, that was her real hair that got caught, or if she had, like, you know... Extensions? Some, yeah, that sort of thing. But I couldn't tell, because I'm not an expert in that department. And the hair was real long, and real crazy, so... Yeah, but it looked kind of like real hair, but it was hard... I mean, once again, I don't know either. Yeah, it definitely wasn't a natural color, that's for sure. For about the first two or three minutes, mm-hmm. uh, uh, when she started, you know, playing the guitar, I thought, "Oh, cool, she's playing the guitar." And then, wait a minute. Yeah, uh, it's like you know, I was constantly looking, and I'm like, "Huh, hmm, huh." I mean, like, I was, I tried to look at the wire that she had plugged into the guitar. I was trying to follow it to see if it went anywhere, you know, and all kinds of stuff. And you know, I was pretty much sure she wasn't, and I was like, "There's still a slight chance she's playing it." But then, like. I noticed once that, like, you know, in between songs, like, she touched the guitar and it didn't make any noise. And I was like, ah, aha. <laughs> aha. Granted, there are many concerts where between songs, they just cut off all those inputs. That eh, could have been the case. I think what would have told you a lot more was that her strumming was not in any way in line with what was going on. It was a little bit. The thing is, I didn't really pay that much attention to the, uh, the strumming. Like, I looked at it, like, once. And it was just sort of like, you know, it wasn't a very complex part of the music, so it looked okay. And, you know, I forget how to play the guitar since I haven't played since fifth grade. But, I mean, her concert was good and ex- ex- expected of any kind of Otakon concert. It was she, reminded me a lot of the uh, New York Tokyo Music Festival. Yeah, I mean, she's a really good vocalist, and she did surprise me in that many times uh, bands like that or singers like that, when you actually hear them live, they often are somewhat a disappointment because their voices are typically so heavily overproduced in the CDs they release. And while it sounded like there was definitely some vocal reinforcement going on, uh, I think she's a really good vocalist. Yeah, I think she definitely knew how to sing, that's for sure. Yeah. And And she pretty much... singing skills. And she riled up the crowd pretty much as much as I could have expected that crowd to be riled up. Yeah. I think in order for that crowd to be riled up more, she would have had to, uh, you know, either had a real band of some sort, you know, to pump up the volume and possibly more songs that the crowd recognized. Well, the other thing is that it seems that Japanese musicians run into this a lot, that Japanese audiences are very different from American audiences. Oh, super different. I mean, unless, I mean, there are some concerts where people yell and scream and dance and jump around, but a lot of concerts in the U.S., Everyone will just kind of stand there and listen or maybe kind of dance a little bit, but they're not generally very loud. Mm. And they, they don't react so much. Like, you see Japanese concerts where they do, like, one little look into one corner of the room, and that corner of the room explodes. And here she would do that, and that corner of the room wouldn't even notice. Mm. But, I mean, it was a good concert, and I think, I'm pretty sure they brief Japanese musicians as to how different American crowds are and what to expect. Yeah. I'm also, you know, it's... There's a thing where in real, uh, how do I say this? In American concerts that aren't full of uh, socially not perfect otaku, you know, the crowd is much different than at Otakon. True. I definitely got the feeling that a lot of the people in the crowd had never actually been to a concert arena or a concert venue before. Yeah, if it was definitely like a non-otaku crowd. Granted, there were a lot of people who were. I mean, when Pete and I were headbanging and thrashing and all of that, there were people around us doing the same, and there was a tiny mosh pit that formed in the front. Yeah, and as in any concert, even concerts, you know, with experienced concert goers at them, it's more, it's more, it's a very much a followers game. You know, someone starts jumping up and down, then everyone's jumping up and down. A guy's one person swinging their fist, everyone's swinging their fist. You know. Yep. Yep. It's sort of like the wave at a baseball stadium. Partly because a lot of people don't really know what they're doing, so if they see anyone else who looks at all confident, they'll just do whatever they're doing. Yep. Because they must know, look, he's, he's throwing up the horns, I better throw up the horns. Oh, he stopped throwing up the horns, I better do something else now. Uh, yep, uh. exactly. <laughs> Granted, I'll say right now, I wasn't thrashing or headbanging to Nana Kitata, even though I really liked her set. Yeah. I generally didn't get uh, super into it at all during the entire concert. Well, you never really get into it at any concert. Oh, I do. I get into it sometimes. It's just got to be... When was the last concert you got into it? Uh, Andrew WK, I got into it. All right, that's the one concert I didn't go to you with. Go with you to. At Tool, I got into it in the beginning, early on. Yeah. And then I got tired. (laughs) (laughs) 
But yeah. I don't know. We'll see. Maybe we'll get into it again at the Camelot concert. Well, I got into it. I really like... Well, then again, I really like that kind of music. Yeah. Right. I, I really like just general female, clear, almost nasally kind of vocalist. I mean, I like Ayumi Hamasaki a lot and all that. Yeah, I like her too. She's cool. Now, anyway, Muck was the band that came up after. Now, originally... Because I didn't know anything about Muck. I never I heard did, of them. I never heard of them either. So I went to the internet to listen to their music. I think I went to their MySpace and listened to their music there. And the, I listened to like two or three tracks. And they weren't bad. But they weren't like, you know, none of the songs were like, oh, man, this is an awesome song. You got to hear this. It was just co- sort of generic J-Rock. And I'm like, oh, it's a J-Rock song. Oh, it's See, a Scott didn't song. tell me any of this. When I asked him what the band was like, he said... It's some stupid MySpace band, and that's all he said to me. That's before I listened to the three tracks. Yeah. I listened to the three tracks like two days before Oticon. Well, anyway, we, they, you know, we're waiting. You know, Nanaki today came, and my expectation was, all right, this quote-unquote MySpace band is going to come up. I'll listen to a song. We'll cut out early, and we'll go do stuff in the room. Now, I was expecting to stay till the end, you know, just because it's a live rock band, and unless they're terrible, you know, it's worth it to stay just for fun. Now, they finally came out after hoisting up... Well, first, they hoist up this symbol. It is the symbol of the band, which led to many jokes from us as to what this symbol stood for. Uh, I don't know. We were just laughing. We're like, it's a thing! Woo! Thing! It's a pile of muck. A bunch of people made Prince jokes and all that. Woo! And then the band finally comes out, and I, right before this, Pete was talking about, you know... I would have been a lot happier with this concert. It was harder. I was hoping to rock out at least once. Mm -hmm. And then this band starts playing, and they are approximately 400 times harder than I expected. Yeah, I mean, they definitely, you know, compared to the recordings I heard on MySpace and other wares on the internet, it was definitely way up the volume. You know, maybe it's because I haven't been to a concert in a while. Maybe it's because... uh, I had an expectation of one thing and I got another. But yeah, it was definitely, uh, you know, it's just like every other rock concert you've ever been to, you know? Wait. I was incredibly pleased with this band and there was much headbanging and horns throwing. Much indeed. You know, I don't know if I, you know, I don't know if I'd listen to them or buy their CDs or anything. But... I would. I've already started trying to get all their music because I really did like them a lot. Yeah. I'd say about four of the songs at the concert I really, really liked. And the rest were just, you know, typical good, hard, rock two songs. Eh, There was only really one song that I was like, ooh, that's a pretty good song. It had all sorts of like this funky bass going on in the early parts that I thought was cool. And then when he whipped out the harmonica, that was mad wicked. Yeah, I wish he would have played. I mean, I didn't know he could play the harmonica. And he whips the harmonica out and he plays it for like a minute and then he throws it away. But what he played was really good. Yeah. Why couldn't he have done a song with the harmonica? It's like he just, he was a teaser. He was like, yeah, I can play the harmonica too. Ha <laughs> ha. I think the lesson to be learned, which is a lesson that I sort of already knew and just had reinforced, is that even if you don't like a band, you know, if it's a rock band especially, going to see them live, going to see any rock band live that isn't ass is a fun good time and everyone sounds way good live. I would say, I mean, it was a fantastic concert. It's pro- it was probably better than the average concert I've seen in my life. And I've been to a lot of concerts. Oh, yeah, compared to the average concert, sure. Well, the average concert definitely, I've seen. Yeah, it was definitely above average. I, I, would, I would probably put it in the top 15 of concerts I've ever been to. Yeah. Hands down. Well, I mean, how many concerts have you been to? Uh, 30, maybe. Yeah, so. Yeah. That's pretty right. I mean, it was really good, and I'd say it was the second best concert I've ever seen at an Oticon. Um, I mean, TMR was pretty good, but I enjoyed Muck a lot more than I enjoyed TMR. And Laraku was think, probably my favorite concert at any Oticon for obvious reasons. Well, yeah. I mean, I think TMR, the thing was, uh, is TMR the band and the songs. That, I like TMR songs. Like, I, I have a lot of their MP3s, and I like, you know, to See, listen actually, to them a lot. See, actually... I don't like TMR that much. No, really? Their music really, it reminds me of Two Mix in that, not that it's similar music, but that you hear a song and you immediately think, that's a TMR song. Yeah, yeah, you do. But that, I don't really have a problem with that. Yeah, well, it's just, I didn't, their songs are kind of, it feels to me the way Two Mix feels to you. That's the best way to put it. Eh, Two Mix is okay. You always complain about Two Mix when I listen to it. Because you listen, when you listen to it, you listen to it too much. 
Yeah, but it's not like I listen to the same song in a row. Uh, okay. But anyway, I'm not going to get into that now. I mean, if I listen to Summer Night and then Winter Night. Yeah, I do agree, though, that uh, at the Otakon TMR concert, we had slightly less uh, excitement and fun than at the Muck concert. Simply because, you know, if TMR was playing that little Ram set, I think they would have, uh, it would have been Oh, more they would have rocked the... Freaking house. Yeah, see that you know that's what I'm saying. It's because we were standing in the way back of the main events of the BCC. That Except the thing the is, TMR wasn't the greatest. I think even in that situation, I think I would have enjoyed Muck more because I really kind of like Muck's music. I mean, they're hard rock, but there was a hint of rockabilly. There was a tiny hint of funk in some of their songs. There were definitely a lot of varied influences, and the music was good. Yeah, it, it was. De- it's definitely good music. It's just not. It's you, not something that I would, uh, you know. Well, put you five met, stars and I. You definitely met pretty much any band we ever talk about on this show. <laughs> I met pretty much anything that isn't stupid, wicked, awesome. Yeah, you met everything, and then you seem to find things that are really awesome that I think are kind of meh. Eh, well, you're meh. What do you want? But the concert was fantastic, and the sad thing is. Most of the, a lot of people I talked to were like, oh, I didn't go to the concert, but that's all right. It probably would have sucked. Or, well, of course, I, anyone or, who misses out on something always yeah, sour tries grapes. to, well, it's not so much sour well, grapes. Well, no, that's the definition of sour grapes. The definition of sour grapes is you did something, eh, whatever you did probably wasn't worth doing anyway. It probably sucked. Mm. That's what sour grapes is. I don't know what you mean <laughs> by it not being sour grapes. That is what the fable of sour grapes meant. Yeah, I thought it was, like, slightly different. It's like when, uh... All right, one guy... Someone has grapes. Someone else doesn't have grapes. The guy who doesn't have grapes says, Oh, those grapes are probably sour anyway. I didn't actually want them. Uh-huh. What did you think sour grapes meant? So, well, the difference that I figured is, you know, in sour grapes, it's two guys want grapes. They both try to grab it. One guy wins. Then the other guy says, I didn't want it anyway, when he really did want it. This is more of a case of... Someone told themselves they didn't want it beforehand. So they That's didn't the same try thing. To lying it. to yourself is no different than lying to someone else. Uh, I guess. Now, the other thing was a lot of the people I talked to said something along the lines of, well, I don't like that Japanese music, or I don't like J-Rock, or I don't like music that's live, or just stuff like that. Mm, half of those are probably fanboys who didn't want to go to a real concert. Though I will say that I actually Kate, Adam, and I left the concert well, a couple songs early, partly because I wanted to go to the room and take care of some things. And two, I didn't bring earplugs because I was stupid and my head was starting to hurt. Oh, uh, see, you know, while... Well, the thing is, here's the thing. The concert was only listed to be like an hour long in the schedule. Mm-hmm. And instead... I think it was two hours long in the schedule. Well, instead, Muck played a full set in addition to Nana Day. I think playing. they played every song that they have. <laughs> I'm pretty sure they have a greater library than that. They played so many goddamn songs. Holy crap. They played a full set, and then they played a pretty big extended kind of encore thing. They played like two CDs worth of music. It was definitely a lot of music, and the thing is... It could have been like, it might have even been three albums. I expected it to be a non-full set concert, so I didn't bother with the earplugs. Thus, the concert went on too long, and I couldn't take it anymore, and I had to get out of there. Yeah, see, I'm definitely, you know... Earplugs at a concert are always good because then I save my hearing, and eventually, you know, when I leave the concert, there is a slight... Uh, oh, good God, the, the, the moral here is when I came out of the concert, we couldn't talk to each other at all. Oh, see, I could hear a little. I can hear yeah, enough little. to talk to people, but I still, my hearing's not we perfect. Couldn't, we couldn't talk to each other, especially since there was a loud crowd around us. Oh, a loud crowd will do it, yeah. But then, walking back, we ran into this cool guy who was in the concert, and he comes up, and he looks at me, and he says, man, you were rocking out. Uh-huh. And I was like... Yeah, and then we talked about the concert, and he really, really, really liked it, even though he said something like, yeah, I didn't really like Japanese music, but someone convinced me to go to this concert, and goddamn. Mm -hmm. He didn't say goddamn, but, you know, snakes on a plane, I got to say goddamn. Yep. But yeah, I mean, I can go without earplugs, without hurting myself, but of course I did lose some hearing as science Well, I can. The problem is I've already been to more concerts without earplugs than I would have liked to have done. Yep. Every time, it's because I forget, and it's too late, and then I go to the concert anyway. Remind me when we're done recording this, I'm going to order the really good ones for uh, 13 bucks. Uh, I might just go to that music store. Oh, okay, then I well, won't. if I go to Rochester this weekend, I'll just go to that music store. All right, you do that. I'll get my own, because I'm going to get some for Emily, too. Okay, get your own, I'll get my own. All right, now, well, in closing, the concert was fantastic. I do hope that Otakon continues to use this venue in the future. Yeah, and I hope they uh, get even more awesome bands to put into it. Yeah, I mean, that 
it is such a good idea to have a Friday and a Saturday concert there. That I, I can't stress how good of an idea that was and how well it worked. And I, can't, I can only imagine how good it is for the bands as well. I mean, you got to think about, you know, TMR, huge band, Lar- Larkin CL, huge band. They come over to America, to Baltimore, and they play one show, and then they go home. Playing two shows is like, it makes their trip so much more worth it, you know? Granted, at least Lark had, you know, the arena. Yep. yep. And they did a full concert. Yeah, they did. Plus, I loved seeing the interviews afterward when they get back to Japan and they're like, Americans liked us. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. They just really couldn't get over it. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. But anyway, concert aside, the other side effect of having the concert there was that we went over to that area of Baltimore, which I'd never gone over to before. And we found this restaurant called the Mondo, at, like Bistro something. We ate there with three times. We ate there three times. I mean, we ate there once because we needed something to eat. And the Fuddruckers that we have so many traditions about was closed and out of business. Uh. So we see this place. We eat. It's pretty good food. The next day, for various reasons, we end up going there again. The next day, we need dinner. And we have like 20 people, maybe more than that. I forget how many people. We had the entire extended front row crew together. Mm -hmm. And more. Well, other than the people who weren't at Oticon, which there weren't many. Yeah, we had a lot of people. Yeah, a lot of people. So we're trying, like I'm walking ahead when Scott's kind of right there with me. And we're trying to figure out how we're going to deal with all these people. And I thought we would just eat at like this bongo place. What was it called? Oh, uh, Babalu. Yeah, Babalu. But then I walked over and looked at the menu and we're like, oh, wait, no. Plus, we needed a place that could accommodate that many people because I didn't want to deal with coordinating, you know, who sits with who because that's always just a stupid mess. It is quite stupid. So then I get that we see the Mondo there and I look at Scott and I'm like, let's just eat at the Mondo. It was good food. And I'm like, no, I can't. It's eating at the same place three times. But if you order three different things because their menu was pretty varied and good. I did order three different things. I, I forget what they were. So then... What I do is everyone, you know, the whole group is still like kind of arguing. They're kind of ornery because Scott and I haven't told them where we're going to eat yet. They've been following us for a while. They're kind of, th- it looks like they're trying to stage a coup. Like, ah, let's just go eat somewhere else or ah, let's just do blah. So I walk over to the Mondo and I'm like, can your, can your restaurant accommodate more than 20 people? Could we just take this whole outside area? And she was like, all right. And we took the entire restaurant, effectively. Oh, the entire outside seating area. Yeah, At least thing, half of it, maybe. No, we took all of it, except for there was one table with four people unaffiliated with us, and there was one table that had one empty seat. Yeah. We took the entire outside area, and it was great because we had separate checks for every table, yet we had the whole crew together who we could all talk to each other at the same time, and we drew a lot of stares from the people in the two adjoining restaurants. And we got to see the people line up for the concert. Yep, which was hilarious. It was right there. We like, also with had the stones throw away. Periodically, people we knew would walk by and go, "Hey, that's the front row crew," and they took over that restaurant and they'd come over and sit down with us. Yep, that happened I think twice. Yeah, that was great. Okay. All right, now the room. Oh, the room. We and pretty much craziness. talked about the con enough, other than you know closing ceremonies, final thoughts, bits about the food. And every year, we do something special in the rooms. We get a number of adjoining rooms, and we keep the door open between them at all times. This year, we had two rooms with one king-size bed, but that meant there was a lot of empty space also in the rooms. Yes. Now, usually, we throw minor invite-only parties, or we generally hang out, a lot of us drink, and it's usually a really good time. This year, we brought all of the podcasting equipment, and in addition to that, we did a couple of roundtables, and we recorded a bunch of stuff. Now, a number of hilarious things happened in the room. Oh, God. Good God. All First I- of all, there were about 100 jokes about, you know how I know you're gay, as people were in bed and out of bed and sitting everywhere. Yeah, and- which there are two origins to that. One, we saw the movie 40 Year Old Virgin, which has this long segment of two guys playing video games, some fighting game, and the whole time there's going back and forth. You know how I know you're gay? Because of blah, blah, blah. Yeah, well, you know how you're gay? Because of blah, blah, blah. And it was such a typical gamer thing, and it rubbed off on us immediately. Now, in addition to that, we got our first hate mail a while ago. And among other things, the guy accused Scott and I of being homosexual. We're not gay. Well, we're not. But you know how I know we are? (laughs) So, you know, there's only two king-size beds. And at one point, Scott and I are laying in this bed together. And Jess runs over and takes a picture of us. Did you really? I don't remember that. So, of course, we pose. 
Oh, right. Yeah, that picture. I remember now. I'm surprised it hasn't been posted to the internets yet. Gee, I wonder why people don't run home and plug their digital cameras into their computers and then upload things to Flickr. See, James is good about that. James uploads his pictures pretty much the moment he has an internet connection. Yeah, I do the same thing as soon as I get home, you know, so uh, that's what everyone else has to do. You know, if you have a digital camera, take pictures. As soon as you get back to your computer, Flickr. That's your job. Now, also, when we first got the room, we were sitting in there, and we noticed out the window that there's this protest going on outside. We have made it to the rooms, and there is a large, well, not a large, but a protest going on in the street outside. We don't know what they're protesting, nor do we care. But Scott has a picture. And apparently no one else wants to say anything. Protest! Slayer! Oh, that was when he first got there on Thursday. Yes, it was. I think they were protesting some construction company not giving fair wages and benefits to the employees or something. Yeah, I couldn't really care too much. It was some union crap. I don't care. I, I just I found it funny. Yep. Especially since, you know, you couldn't read their signs or anything because they were hard to read from far away. And yeah. Now, of course, the room served multiple purposes aside from sleeping and hanging out and recording roundtables. I mean... Storage of physical belongings. Yeah. Uh, generally, at any given point in the day, a couple people would wander back to the room, often with people in tow who may not have been directly members of the front row crew. Mm-mm-mm. So a lot of funny, interesting people ended up in our room hanging out off and on. Which is always exciting. Cause, yes. Because, you know, it's like, <laughs> we'll be sitting in the room, so we'll call up some people, they'll show up at the door... And there's this crew of people, you know, they expect, like, just us, but there's, like, I don't know, 16 people hanging out in this place that they never met in their lives, you know, and they're here to just talk to us, and they're like, uh... Yep, like, we kept, in Anime World Order, I don't I think if they were busy or they were doing stuff at the con, but most of the time, we'd tell them, like, hey, we're doing something awesome, come and join us, and they're always busy. Mm-hmm. But eventually, a couple times, they came to the room, and one time, when we actually recorded our roundtable... They brought in tow the Ninja Consultants and Fast Karate for the Gentlemen. Yeah, Fast Karate. And the Fast Karate guys didn't say a lot. And I didn't know, you know, like, all right, they're, they seem cool, but they're kind of quiet. Yeah, I was like, hey, they brought these guys, but these guys aren't talking. What, what's their deal? Yeah, then we find out after the fact that they're really cool and really funny. Yeah, I don't know why they didn't open their mouths. Yeah, I mean, the front row crew, if it respects anything, it respects funny people. Mm-hmm. I mean, we respect funniness. I mean, if Hitler told a good joke, we'd be kind of okay with Hitler. Maybe. I said kind of. Yeah. I mean, if he got up there and he was like, that joke from Monty Python that kills people. <laughs> I was going to say it, but I didn't remember it in German. <laughs> <laughs> We're also like people who use hyperbole. Mm. <laughs> or people who have cojones, but we'll get to that. <laughs> so, yeah, they brought extra people. Uh, at one point, uh, I was hanging. Now, here's the other use of the room. Oh, we had the pool party. Yes, Thursday we had the pool party. Which, now, we said we took over that restaurant. We took over pretty much the entire pool at the Renaissance Hotel. Oh, yeah. That was fantastic. And we couldn't take over the hot tub, though, because we overflowed it. Yeah. Now, not only did we take it over with people staying with us, but we took it over with people we knew who were staying with us in other rooms in the hotel, and people we kind of knew, and people we knew who weren't even staying at any hotel. <laughs> Take that, Renaissance Hotel. Yes, we brought so many people in, oh my god. Mm-hmm. Of course, that meant I had to keep my cell phone with me in there, but it was fun. Yep. Now, the other use of the room was that periodically I would wander back to the room, sometimes with Scott Johnson or someone, and maybe one or two of us would hang out and have a bunch of drinks, and, you know, have the typical... Yeah, let's talk about stuff when no one's around. Ha, ha, ha. Ha, ha, ha. Yeah, I really, I I don't really get in on that. I really only go back to the room if I've got something to do there, like drop off stuff, pick up stuff, go to bed, wake up. Yeah, like Friday night while you guys were wandering around doing stuff, and Saturday night while you guys were wandering around doing the movies, I would go back to the room, gather people, hang out, have some drinks, and then wander back to the con and make all sorts of mischief. Yeah, I really, I try to stay at the con as long as possible. I'm paying for the con. I'm going to be at that con as much as I can. As long as there's something there, I'm going to do it. And I'm going to go back to the room at the last minute. Because if I want to spend my time in a hotel room, even though there's plenty of awesome people there, you know, I can spend my time in a hotel room down the street. Yep, the hotel room I basically use to hang out with people I can't normally hang out with. Like, there was one point, and this started something that ended up being really cool. Conrad is a good friend of ours. Come bad. Come bad. We don't see him so often because he lives far away, and now he lives further away. But he came to the room, and we hung out and drunk and told, you know, our deepest, darkest, innermost secrets about love and life and money and politics. 
And, you know, we were getting quite drunk. And then uh, we call up Yuko and all them, and all the webcomic artists are hanging out, and they decide that they want to come hang out in our room. Mm. So I set up all the recording equipment, and God, I barely remember who was there. I know uh, Mookie, who does Dominic Deegan, was there, and uh, Brian Carroll of Instant Classic was there, and, of course, Ido of Fallen was there, and uh, uh, C Squared was there. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't think I need to explain what C squared is. If you don't know what it is, you probably never will. That's I think that's about safe. The thing is, I am probably a bigger fan of C squared than I am of just about anything now. Uh oh. C squared was double trouble. Uh oh. <laughs> uh oh. Yeah, but they all came into the room and we hung out for a bit, and then we ended up setting up all the equipment and recording a fairly long and I think really really good just kind of roundtable about conventions from the. From the perspective of webcomic artists and webcomics and webcomic panels and all those sorts of things, I haven't finished putting it together yet. I haven't even really listened to it fully. And we haven't had time yet, but sometime in the coming weeks, I'm going to play as an episode that entire roundtable, which was very fascinating to listen to, and I think we got a lot of interesting answers from a lot of webcomic artists. It definitely seemed a lot better than... You know, the average webcomic panel at a convention that you're going to hear at every convention. with God, a we ran a panel. better webcomics panel in our room when I was completely loaded, mostly on vodka and... Uh, uh, and also, a lot of it was talking about webcomic panels at conventions and yes. how they're kind of crummy. Also, the fact that, uh, uh, very specifically, I keep picking on Mookie, but I got to say, he is probably one of the most personable webcomic artists I've ever had the uh, pleasure of running into. Yeah, you know, all web, most webcomic artists in general seem fairly personable, you know? They're all kind of friendly, hey, well, I guess what's going personable, on? Well, I guess personable, but also very, I guess, outspoken and charismatic. I mean, a lot of them are somewhat shy or quiet or... There are shy and quiet ones, yeah. Like There uh, aren't any, like, bastards, though, you ever, you know? No, there I'm really saying. aren't. At least I've never run into one. Yeah. Well, now, people said, I had numerous people say that Brian Clevenger was a bastard, which was completely untrue when I finally met him. Yep. I don't know where that came from. I don't know either. A lot of people say Fred Gallagher is a bastard, which I don't think he's a bastard. Yeah. I have my opinions, but he's not a bastard. No, he's not a mean guy. If I no. went up to him and I said, he's hey. He's really friendly. Yeah, if I went up to him and said, hey, he'd be like, hey, what's up? But if I started saying things like, you know, you're a pervert, you draw, <laughs> <laughs> we you don't draw get little girls and Moe and shit, and he'd be all like, eh, whatever. See, the thing is. If only we had Largo, because Largo would be like, ha ha, yeah. Yeah, see, Largo, he was, that's what we need in a webcomic artist. I always think Scott Johnson should get, you know, Rodney Caston and all those other people who were affiliated but are no longer affiliated due to trouble between artists and writers mm -hmm. and form the second rate crew or something and go around causing trouble. The second rate, the, the former webcomic writers of. <laughs> yeah, something like that. <laughs> yeah, that would be hilarious. But look forward to this roundtable when I finally put it on the air, because it was really, really good. And a lot of really cool people were there. I don't remember who off the top of my head, because I don't read many of their webcomics, but I started reading many of them as a result. Yeah, I've pretty much been reading the same webcomics forever. I think the latest one I've added is Dr. McNinja, which is awesome. Yeah, there was that Dr. McNinja cosplayer. Oh, he was awesome. He's in my flicker. That guy was the man. Now, one other particularly noteworthy incident happened in the room. I mean, there were many funny things that happened in the room. Probably too many to ever talk about on the show, but I'm sure they'll I don't come even up. remember 90% of the stuff that went on in the room. We should really set up some sort of webcam? Giant, yeah, webcam type device. You know, I find it funny that I drink and you don't, and I was quite drunk for most of Saturday night, and yet I remember more about the stuff that happened in the room than you. Eh, uh, you know. Yeah, it's just all a blur, man. The stuff goes by so fast. I'm not really paying attention so much. I'm just kind of going with the flow, saying crazy shit. Though Saturday night, uh, after we, had, we did all this stuff, and our voices are all about gone, and I'm completely tired and completely ripped, and Anime World Order finally shows up with a bunch of people, and we're going to do our podcasting roundtable, which at this point, I was no longer awake enough to moderate properly. And uh, I was also pretty uh, trashed. Yeah, plus I, mean, I was, I mean, I was no longer really drunk. I was just really tired and not so with it. I was ready to go to bed, basically. Yeah. But plus, I, had, but Scott, we had I gotta say, you were very much sabotaging my attempts to moderate that thing. Yeah, well, you see, the thing was, is I was like, okay, gotta not lose track. So I was like, all right, I'll do it. I'll do it chronologically. All right, I'll hold this thing in front of me and I'll just go to the right. And that way I won't lose track of what's going on. 
Yeah, that even really though I still, I think if you listen to it, you'll hear me like wander off and being like, huh. Yeah, we're definitely probably not going to play the whole thing, but I think I will play choice bits now. The choice one particularly choice bit. The choicest bit, which I don't think I'm gonna put together the recording of it tonight, and I'm not going to tell the whole story of it tonight, but. Very simply, we had a long-running disagreement with Anime World Order. Now, we love them. We are friends with them. There is a mutual respect. But we disagree with them often on anything that isn't... Well, I don't know. At least we respect them. Who knows what they, what they yeah. really think of us. Well, we disagree with them on anime fandom, though we tend to agree with them on anime. Yeah, at least for the most part. For the most part. Now, it came to the point where Daryl starts uh, talking about this whole thing. He starts getting really into it. And he starts giving this really, 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 like, rousing kind of, this is my epic speech of this con. And he stands up with the microphone. And he's talking and talking. Now, little backstory here. There's a device called a clown pistol. At least this is what Anime World Order calls this device. Yep. It is basically a gun-shaped explosive. Well, you know the uh I mean we didn't we weren't a hundred percent sure what it was before the con and then I figured it out by searching the internets a bit, you know, like the day before the we left for the convention. I think it was actually Thursday I found out mostly what it was. But uh it wasn't until it was used and displayed before my eyes that I was a hundred percent, you know, comprehending the nature of this device. Now you will hear about this again when I play that round table, and I will go into great detail of exactly what happened. But suffice to say, um, Daryl is standing up and he's looking into the air with his arm extended and he's giving this rousing like, this is, my, this is what I have to say about this con and what I have to say about Otakon and blah, 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 and blah, 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 blah. And thus, I can sum it up in exactly three words. And he reaches behind into his back pocket and then he comes forth and he yells, Sick Semper Tyrannus, and he shoots me in the fucking face with a clown pistol. Yep, and then I'm like, the only thing I could think, because I couldn't move, I was reclined, I was tired, and I'm like, I hope he doesn't have another clown pistol. Bang! Bang! He, he did. He did indeed have another clown pistol. Now then the room goes silent, and everyone's just kind of like, and then I start laughing hysterically. <laughs> I think there was a tiny moment when everyone wondered, was that over the line? And I guess the answer is no, that was nowhere That's near the line. That's not even close to the line. In fact, that ga- I gained so much respect for Daryl Surratt after that moment. Yeah, because- I mean, you know, the line would be like if all the guys he brought with him like held us down and they tried to rape us in the butt. That would be the line. <laughs> now, know? would that be... The inclusive or the exclusive line? That would be beyond the line. <laughs> that would be the first thing beyond the now, line. Now, despite the fact that I got some, I guess, flash powder in my eye, and it hurt because I think the wadding hit me in the nipple. Uh. Yeah. And I was covered in this confetti, and I st- the fact that they had the utter testicular fortitude to do the kind of thing to us that we tend to do to other people and beat us to it at Otakon. Yeah, I mean, we it just... I think what it was is, you know, from the uh, the disagreement we had prior to the con is that, you know, they were sort of like grr against us and we were like, hey, what's up to them? So we were totally not having the bad feelings and... We didn't expect an assassination attempt. Yeah, it wasn't, you know, it's like, you know, you think you're good friends with someone and that, you know, you're just having <laughs> good fun with them and then, you know, they secretly want to shoot you with clown pistols. Now, I think it helped that they talked about clown pistols a couple times on the show and then... We kept talking about clown pistols because the words clown pistol are hilarious to me. Also, the fact that the first utterance I ever heard of clown pistol was effectively, and Daryl shot me in the back of the head with a clown pistol, you fucker. Yep. And then there was another story where he almost shot the guest at some con with a clown pistol. <laughs> Great. So, and if you Google search for clown pistol, Anime World Order is the number one link. God. <laughs> They've got the, they got a monopoly on clown pistols. So, good God. I will play the footage from that at a later date. All right. Now, other than that, the con itself, we have a whole bunch of little things, I guess, to cover. All the miscellaneous stuff that didn't really fit anywhere. Now, when we interviewed, well, attempted to interview Jim Viles way back, and then we did the text interview with him by email, one of the things he said was that the food is going to be substantially better, substantially cheaper. Aramark is going to put forth the effort to make the food at the con fantastic. Well, he didn't lie. Yes, the food was at least three times better than it has ever been, and the prices were at least an order of magnitude more reasonable. Yep. Uh, 
they definitely, you know, I think the Khan, fi- the Aramark, def- finally understood what they have to do to sell food to otaku. You know, they had ramen and they had a thing that sold sushi, and they were selling all sorts. They were selling Pocky. Now, here's the thing, and we took pictures of this. Mm-hmm. We thought, all right, we got to go check out this food situation, because Jim said they're trying real hard. And in fact, Wikipedia even linked to that interview we did with him, talking about how the food's going to be different at Otakon. Mm-hmm. And the first sign we see is Ramune, $5. Pocky, like $5. Yep. Now, granted, that compared to the prices that Aramark has had in the past... That's fantastic, but compared to what it should cost, not really so good. Good God, $5 for a Ramune. That is insane. That is more than alcohol in a bar. Yeah, I mean, if you go to the you know the local anime store where the, they have a little mini fridge full of Ramune, you can get a six-pack of Ramune for like $5. So they're selling one bottle of Ramune for $5. You no, know, and... You know, sure, there's a bunch of otaku there who, you know, are all about ramen and, you know, they don't know how to get it in their area, and it's like a rare treat for them. So they're willing to shell out five bucks, and they don't realize that it's actually not that much money to get ramen and Pocky. And there are a lot of people there who, you know, aren't smart enough, or they just don't know that they can go and cross the skywalk to go to the food court, or they're just so lazy that they'll pay more and sit in one place you know, to get food rather than walk over, you know, across the skywalk to get cheaper food. But really, I mean, they tried and they did a good job to improve, but the prices still got to come way down before I'm going to buy food in I mean, the BCC. The, the closest thing to a deal they had was a $6, like, lunch combo, and it was like a burger and a drink and something. Mm-hmm. But that while that might be kind of a reasonable price, from what I gathered from just kind of talking to people, the burgers were pretty much the same subpar kind of bar- burgers they always have. Yeah, and meanwhile, over in the food court at the little mall, you can get an awesome, like, pizza, an awesome sandwich, a haagen an awesome bowl of, you know, noodles and Chinese food, all kinds of awesome stuff for uh, the same price. Yep, and also they had sushi at the Aramarks, which I was really, really leery of, Yeah, and, but I saw some other people who got it, and I looked at it, and it was okay. It was like five or six bucks, but the thing is... For five or six bucks, you could get so much more better sushi, again, in that food court. Yeah, you know, they just really, I don't know if it costs them more to get food, because you know, it might. No, no, I think it's just Aramark really, really wants to make a whole bunch of money off of Otakon. Yeah, I mean, you know, if they rethought, you know, the prices, I mean, if they did sell the stuff at a normal price, you know, and they still made a profit at the normal price... They'd make a shit ton of money, because if they had that and their food was just as good as the stuff in the food court, I'd totally buy it. Well, the thing is, the food really just is never really that good, and yeah. partly because they seem to do it in the typical, you know, kind of cook it ahead of time and keep it warm in a thing for people way. Yeah, I think, I don't know, I just, I don't think they have the capacity to do anything else, though, you know? Yeah, It's I just don't know. how they're set up. It's like going to a baseball stadium and you're like, hey, can you uh, change the food? And it's like, no, it's sort of a permanent installation. <laughs> yeah, luckily, no one really stops us from bringing our own stuff in. Here's the thing, though. I go, you know, I've been to baseball games many times. I've been to many sporting events in my life. Not recently, but, you know, uh, years and years ago. And compared to, like, you know, the baseball stadium next door and the football stadium next door, the prices on the food were high. I mean, you can get a hot dog for... Three or four dollars at a baseball stadium. You know, a good hot dog, relatively good, like a big long one, and you can get all sorts of toppings on it. Here, that didn't even get you a ramen. It's like, what the hell? Yeah, granted, the ramen was very much overpriced compared to everything else. That is true. So that the food true. was better, but I would recommend to anyone going to Otakon to avoid Aramark and go to the food court down the street. Yes, do not buy food in the convention center at Otakon, uh, at least not in this past year. Maybe next year. Who knows? Now, of course, the final bit we usually talk about is the closing ceremonies at Otakon, because unlike most other cons, they're kind of a big deal here. Yeah, the feedback session is also kind of a big deal, but we missed it because you're doing our panel. Yep. Now, I'll note at this time that normally at the end of Otakon, we're yelling and screaming and causing trouble. But this year, as we've said before, we both completely lost our voices on Sunday. Mm -hmm. We drugged ourselves up in order to do our panel. And we pretty much couldn't talk for the rest of that day until, like, the beginning of the next day. Yep, so that kind of ruled out giving any feedback. 
<laughs> which also leaves a hilarious story as to what happened to the front row crew when our the two fearless leaders, Scott and I, are unable to communicate. Mm-mm-mm. Good God, do we have a whole episode about that. But anyway, we went to the closing ceremonies, which were typical closing ceremonies. Yep. Now, the big thing that makes Otakon's closing ceremonies, in my opinion, great is that, one, they have the minor entertainment just to keep the crowd busy until they get the information they need. Then, right away, they announce all the winners of all the contests at the con. Mm-hmm. And they show all of the winning anime music videos. That's this, the reason to go. This started last year. That's the reason year. most people are there. Now, I got to say, last year, I was very much... Uh, overwhelmed as opposed to underwhelmed by the AMV winners. They were good enough to where I thought that maybe, maybe anime music videos are making a comeback in terms of quality. Yeah, they weren't as good as our favorite all-time music videos, but they were definitely quality music videos worthy of being shown at the beginning of Anime Club In meetings. fact, last year, there was only one video was kind of mad. It was this uh, Naruto fighting one, but all the rest were, rest were really good. And I got to say that the 2525 video is one of my favorite AMVs ever. It's a really good video. Like, of course, I find it sad that people didn't vote for that one, that the judge of the co- of the AMV contest had to basically give the special award to it. Yeah. But anyway, this year, uh, other than one video, which was a direct parody of one of the winners from last year, uh, they did the same Ava video with the same song, only it was to Azamanga Dayo. Other than that, they were decidedly underwhelming. Yeah, they seem pretty average videos. Like, I remember, because the way we rate music videos is from back in the day when we had to pick music videos to show at the beginning of Anime Club. Now, consider this. This is a large club that has the internet, knows all about AMVs. You've got to show them something amazing every week or they're going to be mad. Yeah, I mean, if you show them an average crap AMV, they're going to sit there and be grumbly and leave. You know, you the trick with the AMVs is we showed them at the beginning, and most people would stay for at least the AMVs. And if you could get entertaining AMVs, that means they wouldn't leave before the AMVs were over. So then you would turn on the first episode of the show right after the last AMV, and you'd get the people. If you could get them through the AMVs with good stuff, they would stay to th- for the show. That was the goal. Now, over the years, I mean, we have our opinions as to the best AMVs ever, generally. But we in need terms an episode of, on anime music videos. Yeah, but it seems that by showing them to the club, most people seem to agree. And there were, there were some amazing freaking videos that have come out over the years. And it just seems like... While the average quality of videos has gone up dramatically in the last three or four years, the quality of the best videos doesn't seem to have gone anywhere, and in fact may have decreased. Yep. But then again, we haven't been too up on AMVs lately. I mean, I used to religiously watch the winners of every con, and for the last two years, I really haven't had the time to do that. Yeah, it's just too much effort. And But basically, we used to watch a whole mess of AMVs every week to try and pick you know, good ones for the show, I mean, for the, for the club meeting. And, you know, the ones from Otakon last year would have easily been selected, you know, to be played at the beginning of any anime club meeting ever. The ones from this year would have been, like, on the second tier. Like, we would have chosen them if we didn't find anything better. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I I mean, it's not Otakon's fault, but honestly, the AMV contest, if those were the winners... I am so glad I didn't even try to see the AMV contest. Yeah, I pretty much never go see the AMV contest. I mean, I think I sat in it for... Like, maybe five videos at my first or second Otakon, and then I just never went to it again. And I, it's, I'm really glad they show the winners at the closing ceremonies, because closing ceremonies is not a waste of time. doesn't take very long, and I can see the great AMVs without uh, wasting a lot of hours. Plus, I think it takes some strain off of the AMV contest room, because now a lot of the people like me who would go to the AMV contest just because they want to see those few gems... Now can just go to closing ceremonies and see that, so they will not go to the AMV room, and then other people who might not be able to fit in can now see them. Isn't that what it's really all about? You know, you you go to Dig and you go to Fark to see the best stories of the day without having to go read every single thing on CNN. Yeah, but then again, some people go to Total Fark and they dig around for like 20 pages. That's good for them. Okay. Well, it's also good for us because they're like filters. They are. And Otakon is also a filter. A very good one because... While, you know, the winners of the AMV contest might not have impressed us and our hard-ass, you know, very judgmental of AMV ways. Us judgmental? Never. <laughs> I, I, would, I would probably agree that those were the best ones from what they had to choose from. Now, also, the closing ceremonies are very important because typically every year they will announce the dates of the next Otakon, which means half of the room pulls out cell phones and starts getting hotel rooms. Awesome. This year... 
they announced that next year's Otakon, Otakon 2007, will be the weekend of July 20th. That's a way early. Cause Oda- no, no, no. While people originally grumbled, hey, why is it so early? Historically, Otakon has always been around the end of July, the beginning of August. And it's a very recent trend that it was moving to later August. And they have rectified this. Mm-hmm. I don't know, because we've been to how many Otakons? Five? Yeah. And, and they, they've all been no, they haven't. middle of August, early August. The first one we went to was early August. Yeah. And before that, they were late July. Mm-hmm. And this really, I mean, actually, I think the dates are better in many ways, because now it's in the middle of summer as opposed to the end. A lot of high school kids won't have, like, band camp in the way or anything. Yeah, I think the real thing that they have to worry about is they can't be in confliction with you know, any, I guess E3 doesn't exist anymore, but the San Diego Comic-Con can't conflict with that. They can't conflict with uh, any of the other major East Coast anime conventions. The thing is, it's hard to conflict with them because the major East Coast anime conventions are, a lot of them, winter cons. Yep, that is true. Or they're in that other circle of cons where the people who go to those don't go to Otakon and Katsukon. Yep, and they can't conflict with PAX. They can't, you know, there's a lot of things. They can conflict with PAX. So few people from the East Coast go to PAX compared to how many West Coasters go to Otakon. It wouldn't, I don't think it would have there any impact. Are r- there are rumors of PAX East. You oh, I know, out. I know. The thing and is, you packs, can't. You got to watch out for these baseball and football. You know, well, not ba- not football games. There wouldn't be a football game that time of year. But yeah, the baseball having, games. Having the baseball games at the same time as Otakon was kind of annoying. I heard a lot of stories of baseball players causing problems and heckling people. Yeah. Well, at least pe- not baseball players. Baseball fans. Yeah, baseball fans. You Though know? baseball players, apparently, one of the teams was staying in our hotel room. In our hotel room? Well, oh, in our, it's news in to our, me. In our hotel. The whole team was in our room? Well, for the gay orgy. Oh, okay. But they were in the hotel, so Sunday there were a lot of baseball fans ready for the big game, wondering what the hell all of us were. Yeah. And a lot of them were grumbling about how the hotel was sold out and crowded. Yeah, it really doesn't bother me that, you know, the baseball fans are there. I mean, it might have bothered some other people, not me. But it the, definitely the, the Inner Harbor area of Baltimore can barely support the people, the number of people for Otakon. Having a whole nother pile of people there for baseball really kind of stretched. I mean, even Sunday, we went to try to get lunch at the food court, and it was insanely crowded. And there were baseball fans wandering around, and they were talking loudly in the way that people who aren't from an area talk when they're mad and they want people to overhear them. Mm -hmm. They were doing the, what the hell is this? This place is so crowded. How can people eat here? What's up with this stupid town? Blah, 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 blah. Yep. I just laughed. Yeah. Now, that is one thing that Aramark has an advantage over is that the food court is very crowded. If Aramark had decent food and they lowered that price, I would be very willing. I would, in fact, be willing to pay slightly more than the food court just because they would have a seat. Yeah, but I guess the fact that I'd rather go to the food court, despite the fact that I usually end up standing somewhere eating, says a lot. It does say a lot. All right. Now, I guess the final bits we'd like to say is that, one, while it might have sounded that we complained a lot, we complain a lot about every con we go to. Well, I think what it is when we ever talk about anything, an anime, a manga, a video game, anything we ever talk about, we always point out the things that are wrong with it, and then everything else is just fantastic, but we don't really say all the fantastic things so much. We only kind of point out the bad things and let everything else go unsaid. Yep, so suffice to say, while this was probably not the best Otakon I've been to, all things considered, it was a very good Otakon. And I had a fantastic time. And once again, Otakon pulled off the amazing. Yep, I would say this is... This the- was a, this was uh, easily 7.5 to 8 out of 10 for an Otakon. Yeah, I'd easily ag- 8 out of 10. I'd agree with that. I would say that it's the third best Otakon I've been to. And, you know, but if that's not counting the fact that it was boosted heavily by the podcasting awesomeness that we generated for ourselves. I'm only judging by the things Otakon provided and not, yes. my, not my personal experience at the convention. I had more fun at this Otakon than I have had at any Otakon. Yep. But the con itself did not provide as much as other Otakons have provided. But it was still a fantastic con. Yeah, judging by the fun I had, I would definitely say it's the second best Otakon, probably. But judging by... You know, what the con did, the con itself, regardless of who is attending it, you know, that I would give, I would agree with Rim, seven and a half, eight, something around there. Now, we got a few bits from Jim Vowles, the chair of Otakon this year. Uh, one, he, he mentioned to us that I was talking about how there were some crises with the staff, and I wasn't sure if I should talk about it and what was going on, and I wasn't too sure what happened, because it was mostly me, like, talking to staffers on the side or overhearing things, but... 
the major crises were that one, some kid got lost or separated from his parents or something like that. Good job, kid. And the kid's parents were mad because the con didn't have a con-wide paging system, despite the fact that they announced clearly and loudly everywhere that there was no paging system and that the first page of the con book was an ex- it was it the first page no it was one of the pages in the con book is it basically a whole page spread saying that there is no way to page anyone at the convention but the parents were pissed about this and the police had to kind of help find the kid even though nothing happened the kid was fine of course the kid's going to be fine what's going to happen to him at Otakon yeah, Otakon's doesn't... like the safest place in Baltimore yeah unless he walks out onto the street of Baltimore and gets hit by a car or starts bothering homeless bums he- he's going to be fine you know yep and the other thing was that Gaia Online or at least someone who claimed to be working with Gaia Online decided to start hawking Items of value over the balcony in the Otter Bean yeah, they lobby. Yeah, they look. I was there when the guy was doing it, and they look like they were mostly bundled up T-shirts. You know, the kind that they throw into the stands yeah. for baseball now, games. Incredibly stupid idea. I would hope that whoever did that was banned from Oticon because good God was that dangerous, and good God that it caused nothing but problems. Yeah, uh, the thing that really I was puzzled at was I I was standing there watching this guy, wondering what the hell is that guy doing? Wow, that guy needs to stop doing that now. And there's like a security guy standing there just kind of looking. There's people crowding around him, people crowding around the area well, to that which he's didn't throwing look like, goods. That didn't look like Otakon staff security. That looked like BCC security. Yeah, but I then, all right, I'm not done yet. I saw some staffers like go over and say something to him, right? But, and, you know, then he, you know, they he talked a bit for like a few seconds. Then he kind of continued his business a little bit and... Then I walked away, so I don't really know what yeah, happened. Or the thing what, is... I don't know what happened or what was said, but what should have happened is the Otakon staff person shouldn't have even had to talk to that guy. They should have just gone to the BCC staff and said, grab that man and take him outside and take away his badge now. That's what they should have done. Well, no, that's not what I would have done. That's what I would have done. No, well, I'd have been see, like, you're done. Scott, you've never been staff or anything at a con. Yeah. Ever. What I would have done... The thing is, I have this staff instinct, like the security <laughs> instinct now... And, like, it was bad at Anime Next when I'd see punk kids doing something that is obviously not a good idea. And there's no staff around, but I'm there. And I have the instinct from, you know, other cons of, you know, stop them, grab that kid, prevent this from happening, yell at them, do whatever I need to do. And when I saw this guy hawking stuff over the balcony, my instinct was to go stop him. But obviously, I wasn't staff, I'm just some guy at Otakon, so I wasn't about to do anything. Yep. But what I would have done is I would have gone right up there, I would have tapped him on the shoulder, I mean, you know, forced my way through the crowd, and I would have basically said, you need to stop this right now and come with me. Mm-hmm. Then I would have, I, I just would have kind of let the crowd dissipate. I wouldn't have said anything to the crowd. I would have taken him away, make sure anyone who had stuff to throw was also taken away. And then if the crowd didn't disperse on its own, I would have dealt with that separately. But... The mystery of what's going on, what happened, probably would have been enough for that crowd to stop stampeding and over the course of the next five minutes disappear. Mm, maybe. But yeah, they, seriously. I wouldn't have immediately taken away his badge. I would have talked to him and figured out the level of how much he had thought this through, whether or not he had thought to ask for permission, why he thought this was a good idea, and that would have explained to him why it was a bad idea and why he probably should never try to do something like that again ever. You know, I'm, all I'm saying is that you should have they should have stopped him oh, in, yes, a, they in, a, stopped in him. a more immediate fashion than, I mean, uh, than, when than, I, than what I saw. When I was at Animazement... Of course, and, you know, I was standing there for maybe 10 seconds, so who knows my memory versus what happened. True, but when I was at Animazement and a stampede of people who had formed a conga line ran past me... I ran as fast as I could to get to the front of them and stop them before that turned into something dangerous. Yep. All right. Now, the other thing was that they originally reported... It seemed like there weren't many staff at Otakon this year at all. And they reported originally on the website that there were, in fact, fewer staff by the numbers. It turns out, according to the gym, that was a typo. There were, in fact, more staff at Otakon 2006 than there were at Otakon 2005. Awesome. However, there was a shortage of gophers... As a result, a number of staffers were stuck doing gopher jobs, which meant that there were fewer staff to go around. Ah, so while the, you know, the total number of staff people, the... There were more people who have the authority to make decisions or at least deal with situations. But the staff power meter was lower overall. Plus, it took about 12 staff members to deal with, you know, the Ram's Head, and it took staff to deal with the arena and all that. Yep, yep, yep. 
Yeah, I think they're going to have to do something to... Well, Otakon is different from other cons. They need so many staffers that you can't have, you know, the awesome, super dedicated people filling every staff position because you're not going to find five or 600 people like that willing to work Otakon. I'm just saying is that they need to do is, is find some way of uh, getting more people to become gophers. You know? Well, they give gophers a lot of incentives. They do give them a lot of incentives, but I think what they just need to do is they need to make it known, hey, you poor kids with no monies, you can come here you know, for almost free if you do work. You know, I don't think they proclaim it loudly enough. That it's a it's an option. Yeah. Well, they I don't think they could get away with what some other cons do, where they wander around recruiting gophers at the con the whole time. That yeah, definitely they should not do that. I see other cons doing that, and I go, uh, why didn't you do well, this before? Well, it, it con? works. It worked really well at Animazement. It worked okay at KatsuCon, except that while I was doing security and it did pretty well, it seems like a lot of the people they recruited would get their little security badge and then immediately disappear into the crowd and not do their job. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It's real tough to find quality people because you need to have someone who can make snap character judgments. And even then, you could be wrong. Yeah, it, it is tough to find quality people, especially at the convention. I think, I don't know how it should be done, but there, there are definitely people out there who will make good gophers and there are people who want to be staff or just don't know they want to be staff because they haven't, you know, thought about it. And, you know, if they just not to find some way to get the word out there and let people know that this is an option. You can work at the convention and save a lot of money if you want to go there. Well, it's and like panelists. A lot of the people who I think could run really good, really professional panels don't realize that you can actually get a panel at a con. Yep. It's the same thing. It's exactly the same thing. And, of course, while people say, well, why don't you and Scott be gophers? I am well beyond the point in my life where I'm going to do the menial work of a convention. Not to sound, you know, like that, but there's no way I'm going to stand at a registration desk for eight hours. Yeah, I'd much rather go to the convention with a press badge or something like that than go as a gopher. Yeah, which honestly, I mean, it's probably more work being staffed, but it's also so much more rewarding to me. Mm. Of course, there's also the issue that when I needed money to go to cons, I was always able to scrape by, and I never needed to become a gopher. Yep, but you probably would have if it really came down to it. Yeah. Like, it's like at the bottom of the list, it's like, huh, I really can't stay here unless I... If Nuri uh, hadn't bought me food at the first Otakon we went to, I probably would have been a gopher enough to get enough of a discount on my badge to be able to buy food. Yep. Well, there's always the the sub-gopher option, which is work at a booth in the dealer's room for a few hours. That's a very good option. I know a lot of people who do very well doing that. Yeah, it, it's, slight, it's slightly different. I think it's about equal and different to being a gopher, because being a gopher is like, okay, I can't afford to get into this thing. You know, I'm going to be a gopher. But, you know, someone who works in the dealer's room at a convention is like, all right, I can afford a hotel in my badge, but I'm not going to eat well. If I spend half of one day at the convention in at standing at that booth selling stuff, I might get some cool stuff from that booth, and I'll get money, and I can eat a nice dinner and have a comfortable ride home and pay for parking. So I think that's what I'm going to do. But anyway, all in all, Otakon 2006 was fantastic. Ta awesome. We met some of our fans. We had a great time. Uh, I've already looked into getting hotel rooms for Otakon 2007. Awesome. There is a small chance that Geek Nights will have a suite or a penthouse somewhere in the Inner Harbor wherein there will be some sort of podcast party of magnitude. Heck, we might even just rent out like our normal room, like you know, one of those ballrooms in one of the hotels, perhaps our hotel. See yes. how much that costs. Yeah, we're looking into a lot of options. We've got slightly less than a year to do this, but stay tuned. There's going because Big Fire, as far as I can tell, is not so big anymore. Or at least it's underground. I don't see evidence of it anymore. Nope. So while I mean it seems like room parties are on the decline, and I don't see so many of them anymore. And I really want to bring that back in a big way. Yeah, I because think we used to throw some fucking awesome room parties. I saw one advertisement for a, a room party in see, our hotel. See, that's the thing. The moment you see advertisements, that room party is bad. Yep. A room party has to be invite only. Now, I don't mean invite only like, you're cool, you're not, you're cool, you're not. But you only tell people you would actually want to have at your party to come to your party. Mm -hmm. And you have people at the door to not let in people who might cause trouble. In other words, you carry around three business cards. One is the fake business card that has false information. <laughs> One is the business card so they can contact you and visit your website and send you an email. And the third one is the room and time for the secret party. 
and you hand out the right ones to the right people while you're at the convention. So if you saw us at Oticon 2006... Hot girlies always get the third one. I'm sure. <laughs> Cat girls, things like that. Yeah. We will see you at Oticon 2007. I guarantee there will be some sort of awesome. And Oticon was fantastic. I don't know how many times I need to say that. I just want to stress that Oticon was fantastic. It was far and away the best con of the year. Yeah, for, there is a chance we won't show up at Oticon 2007. Though. If we die. Exactly. No, if we die, I will stipulate in my will that I'll be cremated and my ashes will be fired out of a cannon into the cosplay. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> And that was Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for our opening theme. Be sure to visit our website at www.frontrowcrew.com. If you like our podcasts, you'll love our forums. Make sure you visit them. You can send your email feedback to geeknights at gmail.com. And if you want, you can leave us a voicemail at 206-333-1537. Geek Nights airs every weeknight, Monday through Thursday. Geek Nights is recorded with absolutely no studio and no audience. But unlike those other talk shows, it's actually recorded at night.